Thanks, Casey. Well, this is the final week in this series that we're calling Full Attention, where we're seeking to understand uh, how we can, in a world that is distracted and our minds are distracted by one thing or another, busyness and things that creep in, how can we give God our full attention? How can we learn to have a deep life with God uh, in the midst of all these things happening? And how can we learn to love the Lord our God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength? And part of that means we need to turn our attention to the God of the universe who's around us all the time. And how can we pay attention to what God is stirring in us and doing in us? And this morning, as we've done these last few weeks, we've been taking a section of Scripture and some people in the Scripture and their story and what they, their story may teach us about learning to live with our attention more squarely aligned on God, to give God our full attention. This morning, we're looking at these two disciples that were walking on the road to Emmaus. And after, it was after Jesus' resurrection, and Jesus himself comes to meet with them and to talk to them, and yet they could not recognize him. As we grow more aware of our relationship with God and deepen our life with him, we need to be able to have eyes to see Jesus and what he's doing and have some clarity for what he's teaching us and leading us in and how we can do that. We don't know a lot about these disciples, truthfully. There's two of them, we know that much, and one of them's name is Cleopas, we know that much. We don't know much about anything else, about who they were, where they had been going, not much is written about them. We can assume that they had invested much of their life to follow Jesus. They might have been part of the 7 to 2 that Jesus sent out for ministry. They might have been that close to Jesus. They might have just been somebody that was following from a bit of a distance of Jesus. But regardless, we just know that they're walking along the road and Jesus meets them there and yet they're unable to recognize Jesus things were going on in their life they were distracted their minds were displaced they were thinking about various other things going on and they were distracted and what I'd like to invite us to think about this morning as we wrap up this series is how do you have a present tense relationship deep abiding relationship with the God of the universe and how do you train yourself to not be so distracted with the various things going on in our life that you might miss the clarity and the understanding that Jesus has come to give us. We're finishing up this series with a look at the importance of understanding. The importance of understanding and clarity as it relates to a life with God. So we're going to unpack this story a little bit, the story of these two disciples walking along the road a little bit. My hope is as we look at it a little bit closer that you can have gained some perspective of how you might pursue greater clarity and understanding from what God may be inviting you and asking of your life. And to have God's directive, where is he leading you? How can I understand that? Have a present tense relationship with God. Not relying on something that happened three years ago. But have a present tense relationship and you're gaining some understanding and perspective for today. For today. But as we unpack it a little bit, let me pray for us and we'll get into it and see what we can learn together from our brothers on the road to Emmaus. Jesus, it's because of you that we are here, and it's because of you that we can uh, even gather. So, Father, wherever we are in our life with you, I pray that you would uh, keep us receptive to what you would teach us, to how to give our attention to you in a life and a world of full of distractions. May we learn and train ourselves to give you our full attention. It's in these moments that we need your grace and we need your spirit to be moving in us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, before I dive too far into this story to help us understand clarity and understanding, we have to deal at the outset this kind of elephant in the room with these two disciples and their lack of recognition of Jesus. How is it that these two disciples not recognize or not understand that it's Jesus who's walking with them? And I wonder if you've ever had an experience like that, because I hope you have, because I don't want to be the only one in the room that has, where you see someone outside of the typical situation or outside of a typical setting, and you think to yourself, they look familiar, but I don't know their name. I don't remember where I know them from. I have a hard time recognizing them. A couple of years ago, I was deciding to go get some ice cream, and I went through a drive through to pick up ice cream, and I came up to the drive through window, and the young girl that was at the register there, I recognized her somewhat. I, I kind of thought I knew her, but I wasn't 
quite sure. And I didn't want to say anything. I didn't want to make it awkward and say something and be wrong. And so I just left, took my ice cream and left. I came home that night and I asked my oldest daughter, Samantha, if her friend from soccer was working at this drive-thru, if she knew that she was walking, working there. I told her I thought it was her, but I didn't want to be awkward and say anything about it. So I just left. I wasn't sure. I just left. And Samantha said the next day she went to school and this young this friend of hers came up to her and said, hey, was your dad in the drive-thru? Because I saw him and I wasn't really sure and I didn't want to say anything. And so we just kind of <laughs> left it at that, left it at that. But here's the thing you need to know about this. Samantha had played soccer with this girl for years. And I had seen her multiple times a week. And I would spoken to her. I would talked with her at the, at the uh, soccer field and at the banquets. And I'd, we'd seen each other. We had known each other, talked to each other. We'd recognize each other pretty easily. But she was in a different uniform, in a different place, at a drive through window. And I just wasn't sure. I had a hard time recognizing her because she wasn't... What I thought, where I thought she was supposed to be. There was something familiar about her, but I couldn't put my finger on it, and I just kind of left without saying anything. We just kind of went on from there. Because I had a hard time recognizing. Hard time recognizing. The disciples in their story had a hard time recognizing Jesus. Maybe because it was in a spot where they weren't quite expecting Him. Maybe because it was in a way in which they weren't quite sure. Scripture says in Luke chapter 24, verses 15 to 16, as they walked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Now, some commentators, biblical commentators, scholars, think that it's God himself who, who keeps them from recognizing Jesus. But most scholars and most commentators think that the hindrance lies not in God stopping them, but from within themselves, within the guys, within the disciples. That there was something going on within them that stopped them from being able to recognize Jesus. Their hopes and dreams for a Messiah had been crushed. Their their body language kind of spoke of this deep despair. Their faces were downcast. They weren't looking up. They weren't paying attention their messiah after all had been crucified and been laid into into a tomb and the rock had been pushed over there i mean there was a story that these women were perpetrating that are saying that jesus had risen but they hadn't these disciples hadn't seen jesus their hopes were crushed their dreams were gone and even when jesus came to walk with them they had a hard time recognizing him There are at least a couple of reasons I want to suggest that the disciples had a hard time recognizing Jesus at this time. And I want to suggest that sometimes these couple of reasons are reasons why we have a hard time recognizing Jesus and understanding what Jesus would have for us and stops us from having a deeper life-giving relationship with God right now. And the first reason is that these disciples had wrong assumptions about Jesus. They had some wrong assumptions. They were still holding to the claim that they thought the Messiah was going to kick out Rome and they were going to establish a political power in the region and they were going to do this and and they were holding on to this claim, this wrong assumption about Jesus. And many of our misunderstandings and many of our difficulties in our life, when our life with God comes from the aspect that we are holding on to wrong assumptions about God that have been maybe passed down to us from other people. Maybe they're things we heard when we were younger. Maybe they're things that people have said in our culture, but they are wrong assumptions about God, and we're holding on to these wrong assumptions, and they can blind us to see the Jesus, the God of the universe, who's in our midst. And we have a difficult time understanding a life-giving, present-tense relationship with God because we hold on to these wrong assumptions about God. We assume that God loves us when we do religious activities for Him. And that God will love us as long as we have a list of things that we do and the list of the naughty things that we don't do. And that God's love is contingent on our behaviors. So we are filled with grief and with guilt over what we haven't done and ways we have not measured up. Because we assume that God only loves those that do the good things and stay off of the naughty list. Friends, can I tell you that that is contrary to the God that we see in the Scriptures, whose love is abounding from generation to generation. But we hold on to this, these assumptions and they can block our vision. We assume that God is angry all the time, or at least most of the time. 
And it's our job as, as followers of Jesus to just kind of do enough to appease God or to make him not mad at us all the time. We assume that God, is, his, his normal way of living is angry and he stands up in heaven just with this scowl on his face ready to just smack us when we get out of line or when anyone steps out of line. And here's one that stings a little bit. Because we assume that God endorses everything we do while he disapproves on what someone else does and their lifestyle. We assume that God endorses all of our decisions and how we spend our money and how we deal with our stuff and how we parent our kids. And we assume that God disapproves of how someone else does those things or their decisions. Can I tell you that that's contrary to the God that we see in the Scriptures? Here's the thing. When you make wrong assumptions and you hold onto these wrong assumptions like these or any number of others, it will keep you from actually knowing and growing in a deep life with God. Wrong assumptions about God that have either been handed down to you or have been told to you or have been perpetrated by our culture. Wrong assumptions about the God of the universe will stop you from acknowledging, recognizing, and seeing a deeper life with the Lord of the, of the universe, the Jesus who's in our midst that desires an intimate life with you. But there's more than that. Not only do these disciples have a hard time recognizing Jesus because they were clinging to wrong assumptions about God, but they were also overwhelmed with their emotions and with grief. Overwhelming emotions and grief can stop us from recognizing God in and around us. Painful situations, and if you've ever dealt with one, you don't need me to tell you this, but painful situations can have a a way of spiritually numbing us where we just kind of get numb. And we don't feel anything. We don't experience anything. We're going through the motions, but there's no life there. And while I hope you know me well enough to to know that I'm not advocating in any way, shape, or form that we fake it, that we just put on a church best face and fake it and pretend that the sadness or the grief or the pain or the stuff that we're going through isn't really that big of a deal. But we do need to understand and be careful to not allow the pain and the emotions to cloud our understanding and to not allow it to cloud out what God is doing. How do you do that? How do you let go of some of the wrong assumptions about God that we've been handed and that we cling to? And how do you not allow the emotions to run amok where our grief and our pain and the sorrow that we may be experiencing just clouds us from being able to experience and to see what God is doing. How do you do that? Well, I hope we can learn from our two friends on the road to Emmaus and when Jesus interacts with them. Because they show us a little glimpse of how we can have understanding and how we can push against this lack of recognition. And the first thing is the power of friendship. The importance and power of of friendship. We talk a lot about this at Crossroads. The power of having a spiritual companion to walk alongside you, to meet you where you are, and to walk alongside you as you pursue Christ together. So there's a lot that we've talked about having someone walk with us, but I also want you to notice that Jesus comes to them and walks with them. He doesn't come to coercively power over them. He doesn't come to lecture them about what they are doing and what they're not doing. He meets them where they are, in their grief, in their despair, in their sorrow. He meets them where they are, and he walks with them. Jesus demonstrates the power of friendship to help someone understand God's movement and God's desire in their life by meeting them where they are and walks with them. Jesus models for us what it looks like to have true friendship and the power of true friendship in a life of a person deciding to follow after God, that they, we need this kind of friendship. Writer Tom Rath in his writing, Vital Friends, writes this about friendships. He says this, Friendships are among the most fundamental of human needs. In fact, we are biologically predisposed, predisposed to this need for relationships. 
And our environment accentuates this every day. Without friends, it's very difficult for us to get by, let alone thrive. In the midst of their grief, in the midst of their pain, in the midst of their sorrow and confusion, these disciples needed a friend to walk with them. Their vision had gotten clouded by the emotions and the wrong assumptions that they were clinging to. They needed someone to walk with them to keep their attention squarely focused on God and what God is doing. And can I suggest to you that wherever you are in your spiritual life, whether you've been following Jesus for three minutes or for 30 years, we need each other. It is far too easy for our eyes to get clouded and distracted by the emotions and by the pain and the grief and the wrong assumptions in our culture. We need spiritual friends to to keep our vision clear to help us recognize God's call on our life, to step into that calling with faithfulness and obedience, the power of friendship to walk alongside us. No matter where you are in your spiritual life, you need spiritual friends. And not all friendships will get there. Not all friendships will get to the depth of spiritual friendships. But a few can. A few can. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen by default. It's going to take intentionality. It's going to take time. It's going to take conversations. Not all friendships go to the level of spiritual friendship. But some can. Some can. And if you're thinking of somebody right now in your life that plays the role of a spiritual friend, maybe you have someone that you have conversations with regularly about your life with God that helps keep your vision clear then right now, before we do anything else, in your heart, you need to thank the Lord for them. Because it is difficult. It is difficult for you to get by in this life without them, let alone thrive. So if you have someone in your life that comes to your mind as a spiritual friend, then before we go anywhere else in your heart, you need to thank the Lord for him or her. And if you don't have someone if you don't have someone that comes to mind as a spiritual companion or a friend of yours that can walk with you, then before we go on beyond this part of the scripture, in your heart right now, you need to begin to ask the Lord to send you a spiritual friend. And be on the lookout because God very well may be sending them your way. Begin to ask the Lord to send you a spiritual friend and now begin to look. Be on the lookout for who the Lord may be sending your way. But there's a second thing that I want us to notice in this little story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And that is that not only that Jesus demonstrates the power of and the truth of friendship, but Jesus opens the scriptures for them. Opens the scriptures. I talked a lot about this last week and the role of scriptures as Katarina talked about Lectio Divina and the reading of scripture to listen to the voice of God in the scripture, to allow the scriptures to wash over us, to, to be true to us. And while there's a place for friendships to come and to meet us where we are, and there's a place for friendships to kind of sympathetically walk with us, to walk in the mess of our life with us, there comes a time when they need to help us confront the misunderstandings that we have. There comes a time when the misunderstanding of God or the the misunderstanding of the truth needs to be confronted with the truth of Scripture. Because many of us have false narratives about God, about what it means to follow God, about what it means to live a successful life, about what it looks like to confront or to live in a culture that is changing all around us. Many of us have false narratives about that. But the Scripture, the truth of Scripture, all the false narratives that we see around us are confronted by the truth of Scripture. And we need someone, friends, to walk alongside us that can open the Scripture with us and that can pray through the Scripture with us and to allow us to see it. Because Scripture itself has power to awaken us to the reality of God all around us. It is vital in, the, in our role to remain attentive and faithful to a deep life with God. And we need friends to gather around us and to open the Scriptures together. That we can understand what God would have for us. To walk with us. To be with us. Paul writes to his young friend Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that all Scripture is God-breathed and therefore is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 
Scripture just has the, a way of challenging our wrong assumptions about God, about our world, about ourselves. And it's more than just studying the Bible for studying the Bible. We need friends to come with us, to ask Jesus to be in our midst, to open the Scriptures to us that we may gain understanding and clarity. See, spiritual friends meet us where we are. They walk alongside us through the pain and through the grief and the overwhelming emotions, through the questions that we may have. But they also bring us to the Scriptures. And they help to walk with us as we open the Scriptures together. They don't allow us to stay stuck in our false narratives, but they call us to a deeper sense of understanding of who God is, a deeper understanding of who we are, and a deeper understanding of what God may be calling us to. There's a third thing I want us to notice in this encounter with Jesus these disciples have on the road to Emmaus. And that is the power of breaking bread together. The power of breaking bread together. As as Jesus and these disciples approach the village that they were staying at, the disciples start slowing down and turning, and Jesus continues as if he's going to continue on the road. And the two disciples invite him to come and to stay with him. And as a side note here, it's very interesting, and we ought to pay attention to it. Because there's something very significant about the nature of God, who wanted to be invited over. Who was okay with continuing on if the disciples didn't want any more of him. If they had heard enough and they were going to go on their way, Jesus was okay with continuing on. It tells you something about the nature of God who wants to be invited. Wants to be invited. There's so much there that we can talk about. We'll save that for another sermon another day because we got we to keep moving. Got to keep moving. So Jesus goes with them and as they're dining at the table, they're sharing a meal together. They break bread together. And the term, biblical term, to break bread with one another on like the most basic level is just simply the sharing of a meal with one another. It's the sharing of a meal. It kind of traditionally, the Jewish customs, they would share a meal and the host of the home or somebody in there would say a prayer over the meal or they would bless the meal. And the disciples would see that happen on time and time when Jesus was doing that. And Jesus at this point blesses the meal. Very similar to how we would say grace or say blessing before the meal that we have. But there's something very sacred about sharing a meal together that cultivates friendships, that helps us become more aware of what God is doing in and around us. It's a relaxed setting of a meal. It's not formal. It's not a classroom setting. It's not even a church service where you're sitting there listening to what I'm teaching on, but there's conversation that happens at a dinner table. It's more relaxed. There, People can talk back and forth with one another, and we can open up to one another. We can open up to what God is doing in our very midst. There's something about a meal that is very powerful, something about sharing a meal with one another. And at Crossroads, one of the greatest or one of the best ways we can grow in our apprenticeship to Jesus is to be known by love, to know one another, to not, get, to not be s- satisfied with sitting in chairs on Sunday morning, but to be known by someone, to sit across a dining room table and to share a meal with one another. And one of the best ways we do that is in our life groups, where you can connect and develop these kind of spiritual friendships with each other, centered on the Word, where we can open the Word together, and we can talk, and we can have the free flowing, and there's food there, and we can have a meal together. And one of the best ways you can push against the anonymity about coming into a weekend service like this is to be involved in a life group where you can sit in a more relaxed, casual environment, and you can open the Scriptures together. Many of you are involved in a life group and you know the life-giving way in which that life group pours into you. But some of you have never experienced that. Or maybe it's been a long time since you've been in one. Can I just simply suggest a very simple, very easy way to apply the message today? Take the risky step and grab your worship folder and in the insert there is a communication card. Fill that out and mark the little thing that says, I want to be in a life group and drop it in one of the tables or on the little trays on the high top tables as you leave this morning. And somebody will get with you Tuesday or Wednesday this week and will call you and try and figure out a way or email you, find a way for you to get involved to share a meal with brothers and sisters 
as we walk along this road to step out of the anonymity and to step into spiritual friendship and to find a place for that. Find a place. One final word on the importance of breaking bread that Luke draws our attention to in the passage. We're told that Jesus blesses this meal, and as I said, it was this kind of customary thing for Jewish people to bless the meal before it was happening. But Luke's wording is really significant. The way in which Luke words it is really important for these disciples to see what's going on. Jesus said, or Luke says that Jesus at the meal takes the bread and after giving thanks, broke it and gave it to those disciples. Very, very similar words that Luke uses to describe how Jesus at the Lord's table takes the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. And I want to say this as clearly as I can. Any meal with brothers and sisters gathered with thankfulness to God where Jesus is in the midst is a sacred meal. Anytime you gather across a table with a brother or sister and you're seeking to follow Christ together and you share a meal, there's sacredness to that meal. But Luke is wanting to draw our attention again to the sacredness of the communion table and the Lord's table. And we spent a whole series talking about the importance of the Lord's table. So I don't need to rehash it here. You can go back and listen to those or watch those videos on the website. But when we gather as God's people and we come to the Lord's table, I want us to be reminded that we are opened to the presence of Jesus in our midst, meeting us at that meal. It's not just religious things we do, but we come to meet and encounter the risen Christ who's in our midst at the very time. Well, I told you that we began this series with a commitment to be very practical to learn to train ourselves to have our attention drawn towards God, to explore ways not to just talk about these things, but to give us some very practical things to train ourselves in the weeks to come so that we can give our our, our attention to God throughout our week to deepen our life with God. So as a way to wrap up this series, I'm going to give us one final exercise that I'd like you to consider doing this week. Aside from signing up to be a part of a life group and that may take a week or two or three weeks to get you plugged into a life group that may happen there but aside from that let me give you one final exercise to put into practice this week even today make an appointment with somebody find somebody to do coffee with or breakfast with or lunch with or dinner with find someone in your life that is pursuing the things of god and make it a call this afternoon and say can we get together And let's have a conversation about what God is doing in your life. The person that came to your mind as I was talking about a spiritual companion or a spiritual friend earlier this morning, that person would be a great call to have. Give that person a call, maybe even this afternoon, and say, this week, before next Sunday, can we get breakfast, coffee, lunch, dinner? Can we do something? And when you gather for that meal and you share that meal or that cup of coffee with someone, and you invite the presence of God to be there, it is a sacred meal, and Christ is there. Christ is with you. Maybe you ask them about how their life with God is going. Maybe you ask them about the role of communion in their life. How do they experience communion? How is it impactful for them? Maybe you just open up yourself to walking alongside and to learn that friendship is a vital component to this life with God. And this afternoon, I'd expect lots of phone calls to be happening. Make those calls today. And may your friendships move beyond a friendship and move into spiritual companionship centered on Christ. And may they help to keep you attentive to the power and the presence of Jesus in our midst. And may they lead you to be more faithful, more obedient to his calling. And may they bring clarity and understanding for what God is calling you into. Not only for this week, but for this month, this year, and for the next decade. May you experience the richness of spiritual friendship. Let me pray for us as we go. Jesus, it is humbling that we come before you this morning. And we pray that you would move in our midst and these phone calls that happen today or tomorrow. May we experience the goodness of life together. 
And may we challenge one another, sharpen one another, and may we let go of the wrong assumptions about you and about life with you. And may we be aware and attentive to what you're doing in us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.